good, good morning. My name is Paul Holdengraber. I'm the director of public programs at the New York Public Library, known as Live from the New York Public Library. When I came to the library and I was hired by the former president of the library, he said to me, I want you to oxygenate the library. And so now I often say that I make the lions roar. I try to make a heavy institution dance, and when I'm successful, to make it levitate. It's a very, very large institution, as you know, on 42nd Street, uh, with two lions. They have names. You should know about them. Patience and fortitude. Fortitude, you can impress some tourists when they come by knowing that it's closer to 42nd Street. Um, my, my goal here today is to try for us to talk about teamwork. Now, what's interesting also here is how we are on this panel in the, on, with this long table. I had asked, but much too late, a, a couple of days ago, that we might sit in the round. And it's interesting to me how we are set up here. It's not the, the most uh, convivial way to be speaking. So in some way, we are... Um, creating a problem of communication here because, and this is why I'm sitting here, this is not in any way to talk badly about the kind people who invited me, but it is to, <laughs> of course, but it is to say that one of the most important things we can do when we talk to each other is look at each other and look at each other's eyes. As I often say, you can't tickle yourself. I mean, there are doctors here who probably think you can tickle yourself, but it's hard. Try tickling yourself, it doesn't work. We need, in other words, we need others. We need others in order to be able to have a conversation, to be able to talk to each other. We need to look at each other and have reactions to each other. Now, the interesting thing for me is to be invited here to uh, instigate, I prefer the word instigate to moderate because I'm not particularly moderate, to instigate a conversation about teamwork. Because I put down two conditions to my employment when I came to the library. I forgot the third, which would have been compensation. But the two that I put down, which were very important, was I said, no meetings. I love meeting people, but I don't like meetings. And no committees. And the president said, OK. I had forgot, forgotten the third term, he was fine with it. By no committees, I meant that I will make decisions, but they will be made on the basis of what I would call an informed subjectivity, a subjectivity that is porous, that in some way leads us to understand um, the influences of others. We're never, ever alone. So. Without further ado, I'd like to now uh, be able to introduce each one of our panelists. I don't know if they want to do give comments at the beginning. In, in some sense, I would no, right? Yeah, no, let's talk immediately. I mean, comments at the beginning, you know, and then you end up having a panel. Panel, by the word, is a word we should exclude from the English language, in my view. Um, then you have these initial commentaries, and by the time you get to the discussion, you have seven minutes, and then you look at the audience. Have you noticed this in academic circles? You look at the audience and say, I'm, I'm so sorry, we have no time for questions. <laughs> so we're not going to do that now. Um, for the last few years, um, one of the things I've been doing is I've been asking people at the library to give me a biography of themselves in seven words. A haiku of sort, or if you're extremely modern, a tweet. <laughs> and um, I'll begin with Michael Bierut, uh, who's a partner at Pentagram since 1990, and his was really a haiku. You sent it to me in an email, and it looked it was very beautifully done. Each one word on one word on each line. Always wanted to be a graphic designer. And then you put equal seven <laughs> words in case I didn't know. And then, uh, <clears throat> which was helpful. I mean, and then uh, uh, Gordon Edelstein, uh, the artistic director of the Long Wharf Theatre in, in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, said, getting underneath the bottom, lifting from there. Uh, John Goethner, also of the Idea Factory, Bell Labs, and the Great Age of American Innovation, which I had the pleasure of reading just now, um, which is extraordinary, really a fantastic book, editor at large at Fast Company magazine, wrote to me, only words make sense of the world. 
And then uh, Rosalind Taylor O'Neill, um, the principal consultant and Cook and Ross, wrote, respectful lover of my and other voices. And then Matthew Van Beeson, the director of the New York Philharmonic, wrote very humbly, average, music, focused, frustrated, we'll, we'll talk about frustrated, transformed, leadership, and then a dash, still working on this last chapter, dash, word. Okay, now you know, the, you know all the participants, please welcome them. <laughs> Now, um, Gordon, I'm going to start with a, a commentary that you sent to me and read it out and uh, ask you to comment on, on, uh, on it and have others react to it. You say a director's job is to be an autocrat, a facilitator, a fortune teller, a, a calculating manipulator, a psychologist, a seducer, a psychophant, a bully, a friend a groupie, an architect, a conductor, a choreographer, a supplicant, a critic, a mother, a father, a child, a visionary, a raconteur, a laugh track, a provider of Kleenex, a motherfucker. I, 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 I'm sure you didn't want me to read this out loud. I show, my I show my cards, I hide my cards, I'm an open book, I'm a filthy, disingenuous liar, I lead, I follow. Your turn. <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> those are all the things. I mean, I, I tried to just sort of free associate um, all the things that happen um, in the process of putting on a play, four or five weeks of rehearsal. Um, but, um, you know, um, uh, when we lie, when I lie, I lie because uh, somebody is doing badly and I want to encourage them. Um, or, um, but um, I was very moved by Joe Torre's words because he was describing, as he was describing what he did with the Yankees is what I try to do in every rehearsal I'm ever in. Um, it is um, all about uh, taking the talent of the people that you have, trying to get the very best people that you have, and um, loving them um, and uh, facilitating and encouraging them to make the wildest, bravest choices they can make. Um, creating, because we do our work, you know, um, I do my work in a room. Uh, 15, 20, 10, five actors come into a room and I um, try to create an environment in that room which brings out the best in everybody. I try to say which house we're building, and then we all try to build the house together. Um, and uh, my job is to encourage everybody to, to um, be better than they could ever possibly imagine they can be. And when we created a room that's fun and mutually supportive and joyous and sad and thrilling, and when we're all in it together, sometimes the results are something to be proud of. Brother Lynn Taylor O'Neill, um, one of the things you, you believe most in is the uh, importance of diversity uh, in teams. Um, you've been hired so often to bring diversity into teams, and I was reminded of a, of a comment by the former president of Dartmouth who said, we learn the most from those who are least like ourselves. And I wonder if you can comment yeah. on that. I think that that's, um, what's really fascinating is when I was listening to uh, Joe Torres and, and when we were talking a little earlier, is um, the dilemma that I believe organizations find themselves in is that the way that we have gotten to success, and that includes this institution, is not the way that we will be able to maintain and sustain success as it evolves going forward. How do you mean? Well, the mindset, the, uh, the problems that we solved, the way that we solved problems, the way that we engaged people um, over the last 20 years is not in any way going to look like the way that we can do it going forward if we hope to be very successful. 
And part of that is because the tribes have changed. We are really tribal as, as human beings. You, you mean we, we want to be with those who are... Who are like us, who are members of our kin, tribe. Who are kin. 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 Yes, absolutely. And that kinship um, that it, sometimes we refer to as homogeneity has gotten us to here. But in fact, the most creative, the most innovative, the ways that... Um, that we will bring new people into the theater, new people into the symphony, new people into organizations, new people into institutions like this one, is really by an expansion of our kinship. And that that is the work of inclusion and the work of diversity. It's, a, it's expanding that kinship. And I think that that is the most difficult for us because we... What is our resistance? Well, you know, uh, okay, so I'm going to use our meeting this morning. Um, as you can tell, I am actually the only African-American woman on the panel. I, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and say I, it. I, I, I'm going to put I, it out there. I, 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 I know that some of us don't want to you know, acknowledge that because we don't want this to be about race. Um, so, but I, in fact, am. And when I first walked up to this group of, um, at this time... Han uh, handsome men. Handsome yeah. men. Ha yeah. Tall. <laughs> Tall, handsome men, okay? Yeah, yeah. Not only, not only yeah. handsome, but tall, handsome men. Um, <laughs> I immediately felt like I was not a member of the tribe. And behaviorally, I was not brought into the tribe in the short. Part of that is because we don't think about it on a conscious level. So. So there are two pieces of work. One is for all of us to get to a place where we begin to expand our notion about tribe, and two is for people who are not members to get in. And you know, I'm, I'm of course able to do that because I just tell you all you're handsome and you know, that lets me in. Because it's really a cheap ticket. <laughs> you know, the, 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 when I use the word kin, it's also important because the origin of the word kin created the word kindness. So um, in yes. some way also, we, we are of kin, meaning we understand each other, but also what you're, what you're trying to tell us, which I think is incredibly important, is that we need to expand our horizons and, and work with people of all kin in, in, in some way. Now, when you were talking about the behavioral dis difference that happened within you, I would also say that the behavioral difference happens within us. Yes. Um, so um, it, it creates an interesting relationship um, uh, trying to understand you know how how do we how do we behave differently and how do we open the circle and you're uh, uh, Michael uh, Bierut your um, uh, design firm uh, you wrote to me has a very interesting way of working together which has a lot to do with um, how people are compensated in what circles they work um, I've always been very interested by, by this notion of a silo, um, uh, uh, people working in separate areas, often not communicating quite. I mean, I, I can't tell you how often I get emails from people at the library who work in an office right next to me. God forbid <laughs> they should ever talk to me. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm very curious as to um, how uh, Pentagram has been working for four decades, it would seem. Um. I, I'm, I get interested very much in the idea that structure creates um, the conditions for teamwork. And, and almost, I think, every, every single person on this panel can talk about that from their own point of view. My firm was founded in 1972 when I was in the ninth grade. It's called Pentagram because five guys came together. Each of them were, was a designer who was accustomed to working on their own. They decided they can compete better with big firms if they mass their resources. But they still liked kind of working independently. So they said, OK, let's each run a separate profit and loss. Um, and let's each kind of have autonomy within the teams that we hire. Um, but at the end of the year, we'll take our compensation. And regardless of how much one person made or one person didn't make, we'll share it all equally. 
And uh, that was in 72. We still do it like that today. Now there are 19 partners, of which I'm one, five offices, uh, London, New York, San Francisco, Berlin, and Austin, Texas. And the thing that's really interesting, and I was thinking about this when Rosalind was talking, every new partner that's joined, and I joined halfway through this history in 1990, every, nearly everyone that's joined has come from the outside. The typical thing to do in lots of different institutions, certainly in architecture firms, creative services firms, even professional service firms like law firms, is you sort of, it's thought to be good to grow them from the inside. So people that are coming up to leadership roles are completely inculcated with the uh, culture of the place. In our firm, we feel almost exactly the opposite. We will literally be considering a new partner joining and we'll reject them because they're like, they're too much like what, what we do already. We purposely try to reach out and get someone who's sort of from the outside. And that's, you know, and that's, that, that, that has to do with gender and, uh, and um, um, ethnic diversity, but also in terms of just cre the creative way of working, you know, whether you like to, whether you're intuitive, whether you're methodical, we sort of find that having a mix of people really work. And that same thing plays down to each of the teams that then we manage in turn. Um, you know, the last thing that I would want is to replicate my own personality, you know, and, and, and abilities and, and failures in, um, in the people that I choose to hire to work with me. Instead, I desperately so you, overcompensate so, so, so by who you, I hire. Yeah. So you, 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 you know your shortcomings and hire accordingly. Yes, and, and those yeah. people I hire know my shortcomings even better than I do. And, uh, but th does that create friction sometimes? Um, how do you manage it? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, um, the, I mean, each of us sort of learns to, um, well, at least I, I won't speak for each of us, but I think that I've learned, as some other people may learn, to, you sort of, you, you habitual, you, you, get, you get accustomed to what you can do well and what you can't do well, and the danger is you sort of stop trying to do those things you can't do well, start kind of doing in a methodolo in a kind of habitual way the things you do well. And those, the latter kind of gets stale, the uh, uh, former never really kind of comes into its own. So it's part of the surprise of working with other people, working with people who are different than you, is you get pushed into doing something you don't know how to do and you're just forced to assume a role that is unaccustomed but might lead to something interesting. Talk very quickly because I found that also so interesting how your company makes money. <laughs> because I, I thought it was so interesting the, that you are each, in a way, independent. No, no, it's, 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 no it's really perverse. Like in my office, um, there are um, um, uh, um, eight partners, and each of the eight of us runs our own profit and loss. So every month we get a sheet with eight names on the top, and at the there are columns, and at the bottom column is how much profit we've made to date based on... Uh, um, you know, how much it costs to do the work, how much we got paid to do it, and whether there's a difference, and whether the difference is positive and negative. You want it to be a little bit positive, at least. At the end of the year, those figures are always uh, different. They're never all the same, and sometimes they, they differ radically, like really dramatically. But we all kind of made a compact when we joined that no matter how different they were, we would all get paid exactly the same. So that thing that lawyers do sometime, it sounds so lawyerly. They eat what they kill. They bring in the business, and then they get to feast on that. And that just, you know, the theory is that that's just, we're, t I don't know if we're too nice, or we simply, because we all went to art school, we don't understand math clearly. I'm, I'm not really sure how it came to this, but. Uh. Or, or, or perhaps, or perhaps <laughs> there, there might be a way for a model such as yours to work, even if one is very ambitious. Yeah, well, the theory is, is that, because um, if you're, you've got a kid in college, if you want to remodel your kitchen, the only way you can actually try to uh, guarantee you're going to get a, more, a, a salary compensation to cover that is by helping everyone else succeed. So if a job comes in and I don't think it's the right one for me, I think my partner can do it better, I'll pass it to them. If I think I can help them to do their job better, I'll do it because we all benefit. It's, and, and we benefit in other ways too. The money is just kind of the more the most uh, uh, you know, easily exposed, because you can take out a calculator and do it, but there's lots of other ways that we uh, can share success, and some that are actually more pronounced than that, I would say. Thank you very much. Matthew Van Bestien, um, as uh, the director of the New York Philharmonic, how, how, does, it, how, does, how does teamwork work, uh, as it were, in, in a large organization such as the Philharmonic? I've always been, myself, having interviewed quite a few conductors. I love speaking to conductors. 
um, not so long ago to Esapeka Salonen, for instance. And it's such a fantastically mysterious job. I mean, one doesn't quite, one doesn't quite understand what they are doing there, but they're doing <laughs> something, right? They're doing it more to the bassoon, <laughs> less to the violin, but something is happening. Right, right. So tell us well, what, what is happening in your organization when you let try me, to let bring me first make the distinction. In. Let me first make the distinction that I am not a conductor. No conductor would have been up this early with a tie on. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, my, my role is really, you know, as, as others have uh, articulated this morning, my role is to help create, I think in many ways, the right environment, the right, um, you know, I work on the business side of the organization. So I, I, I not only touch on the artistic, but I touch on, you know, selling tickets and raising money and thinking about touring strategy, um, the brand and profile of the Philharmonic. And, and, and my role is really to figure out where the, the the, the business and the practical things intersect at the most optimal place with our artistic side and the aspirations. And um, of course, the vehicle for what we do artistically is 105 individual musicians of the New York Philharmonic. And um, when I've come here to Sinai and when I hear someone like Joe Torrey talk, it's, it's hard for me to, 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 in some ways, imagine that there could be something more analogous than, than a hospital for, full of incredibly well-trained physicians, a baseball team full of superstar players, each magnificent in their own right and yet having to come together as a team. You said before we came here, when we met very briefly before, that you think it would be interesting for orchestra members to come to a hospital and see how it works. Absolutely, and, and, vice, versa, and vice versa, to have physicians sitting within an orchestra to see imagine that i mean to see to see what happens in terms of communication both explicitly and maybe more importantly implicitly that the fact that everyone knows understands their role um, understands what's supposed, supposed to be the result collectively. Um, and the other thing that I am, am always struck by and by the questions uh, for, for Joe Torrey, you know, thinking about you know, marquee players or thinking about stars, um, I'm sure this is the case here at Sinai and, and at a firm like Pentagram. Everyone who's in the New York Philharmonic you know, was a, was a huge star growing up. They were the, always the best person in their, their school program. They were always the best person in their youth orchestra. They were probably the best person or almost the best person in their conservatory. They've been a star their entire life. And in some ways, the adjustment to come into a team atmosphere like never before, I think, is, is part of the real challenge sometimes. In your, in your seven words, and I, I warned you about that, you used the word frustrated. Yeah. They're from my own story. I mean, they're, I mean, you know, average was sort of my description of myself as a child and then finding music. And then for me, music was going to be the vehicle for my life. I was a French horn player. Um, and at some point I became not only frustrated by the challenges of the instrument, but frustrated by the sense of what I saw the orchestral world in particular doing to limit itself long term. Uh, and I really, I really struggled with that. So I, there was a real period for me while I was a professional musician that I was incredibly frustrated. And I think part of it stems from what I said before, which was that um, depending on the path that we take, uh, you, can be, you can have tremendous success at a young age and you have to find a way to transition into a larger context or a different context or find a way to apply the talents or the insights that you feel that you have. Uh, and for me, that was that was my high. Concern. And I wonder, uh, you know, to take your your one word to the, to apply it to an orchestra. If an orchestra might be 104 or five musicians who are each frustrated in a certain way, but by coming together, overcome maybe not overcome or find a way to live with what we all experience at one point or another. Maybe I'm only speaking for myself. That's frustration. Yeah. No, there's no, well, sometimes they can be collectively frustrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, but the, there is, there is that, uh, there are those moments, I mean, having had the privilege, and I consider it a great privilege to have spent time in a professional orchestra of any kind, there are those moments when you're sitting in a performance and you just know within five or six minutes of the performance starting that it's going to be a special night. 
And you would love to think, I think sometimes people think that that's every night, um, but the reality is, it's like Joe Torre said, sometimes you don't feel well, your arm hurts, or um, not every performance, not every moment is special, but when they are special, you understand um, why they're special and how they're special. They're special. But what, what is it? Is it the orchestra coming together in yeah. a particular? I mean, can, what? You I think feel. I think of jazz musicians, yeah. and I think of the you know great moments when Art Pepper met the Miles Davis uh, rhythm section yeah. the same day, and they just jive together yeah. in the most extraordinary way. They just played beautifully, and I think so often at least jazz musicians say we played well because we listened to each other. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, you, there's no, dis I mean, it's what makes art and what makes music incredible is that it's about doing the indescribable or the things that are not easy to articulate through words. And as artists, you just know it, you feel it. Actors feel it on a stage. Um, I think great, great professionals just know when, when things are coming together um, in that incredibly special way. And the thing that I think is key is that the work has to happen um, on all fronts to make sure to allow for that possibility, to, al to create the right environment, to allow those incredibly special moments to, to ha I call it not just being functional, but taking something that's incredibly highly functional and making it brilliant, making it special. I was going to bring in John Goethner, but um, Michael and Rosalind want to say something, and I'd love to precisely not be the only one asking one damn question after another. No, I, Go I ahead. just wanted to ask really quickly, and this is for Gordon too. You, Gordon, you and um, uh, Matthew both spoke very like, movingly about when it all works, how beautiful it is to be in that room, to be, in that, be on that stage when it's special. What about the opposite? How, what happens when it's not just ordinary, but kind of disastrous? What, 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 how do you recover from that? What do you learn from that? How do you build on that? Well, you know, at a s um, usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, um, if it's um, successful in the rehearsal room, it's not going to be disastrous on the stage. I mean, you can have a performance uh, that's lesser, more, more or less successful, but if you've built the, the structure well and you have good people um, of good character, as Joe said before, and, 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 and who, who are committed to something greater than themselves, the show, um, it's not going to be a disastrous performance. Um, once in a blue moon, you um, have a show that doesn't work. That is a horrible feeling. And it's, and it's often happening and you, in the process of getting there, you, right? Exactly yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and um, more often than not, it's my mistake as the director. The director is in some ways an overrated position. Um, director is a new job. You, know, you may know that you know, in 18th century theater, 17th century theater, there were no directors. The actors got together and they put on the show. Um, director is a mostly late 19th century, 20th century invention. And um, you know, my job it mostly is to um, pick the players. That's the most important decision I make is to pick the actors. Casting is 80% of the show and pick the right designers to, to design the show. Um, and if I've done that well, um, uh, usually it won't be a disaster, but sometimes, um, you know, you have a bad idea. I'll have a bad idea. It, it, or it's an, I, and it seemed good. It, it seemed, seemed good, good at the time. Yeah, no, of course. Um, it seemed good at the time. Um, and then I'm watching this in rehearsal, and part of the job is to tell yourself the truth, uh, which is sometimes very hard. Um, and you tell yourself the truth in midway in a rehearsal process, you're saying, you're saying this idea is not working. And uh, how? And what you, can I do, do to salvage it? Give it up. Well, you can't give it up. Yeah. It, that's one thing because you can't. It, it, you know, you're already selling tickets for the show. Um, it may be that you've miscast a role. That is the easiest thing to fix because, God forbid, you can also fire um, fire an actor. You try very hard not to do that, but if there's an actor who is going to bring down the show, you need to fire the actor. I don't do it very often, but. I've never regretted doing it. I've only regretted not doing it. Um, um, but sometimes it's a mis conceptual mistake on my part. Um, and um, the, the sets are being built. The costumes are being built. I, I had an idea to do an Ibsen play and to put it in a contemporary setting. This is a true story. 
Um, I had an idea to do an Ibsen play and put it in a contemporary setting. It sounded good. Maybe somebody smarter or better than I could have pulled it off, but I was watching this idea fall apart. And there's nothing I can do other than, but my job is also to tell, to not, if I tell that to the actors, I have to exude confidence. If I tell that to the actors, we're sunk. I mean, then we're dead. So I have to exude a level of confidence in which I'm saying, we'll just make so, the best so of this that to, we can. So you have to be a, a liar and a seducer and all of that. That's Well, as I said, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just have to put a game face on and do the be make, make the best out of the of difficult the situation the that you yourself have yeah. created, that so I you, myself you have, have created. To, yeah, you have to get out of the mess you created. The older you get, the more you do this, you make, those, you make them very rarely, but... It, you know, it'll happen again. I'll, you know, I hope it does, because that means if it, if it doesn't happen again, it means I'm not taking any risks. Well, that, that's so, that's uh, when you're you know. learning. I mean, this the notion of failure, which we may get to. Rosalind, did you want to add well, something? Uh, yeah, my, and then my, I'll bring uh, John in. My, my question just was really around, um, and and I wanted to bring um, to. To, to also ask it to John, because I know some of the work you've done. One of the things that you said that I think is really powerful for this audience is that um, we have got to learn to listen to one another. And, and that really is, is not as simple as it sounds, because we have ways that we listen through hierarchy, we have ways that we listen through experience. So I think, well, you know, um, um, if somebody has come to the orchestra and they come with this reputation that is just extraordinary, or if it's a uh, one of the the actors who is the main name, that we listen to that person differently than we do the set person or the you know the the third uh, bassoonist. The problem is, it is the total. And that's what Joe Torres was saying. It's the sum total. So how do you ensure that listening well, piece? Well, um, mm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm often asked, because I, I interview people 40, 50 times a year. Tonight, Alice Waters and, and Kermit Lynch. Uh, last week, I interviewed Mike Tyson. I'm still here to tell the story. It was fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm often asked, you know, where the inspiration came from. And I think... I'm probably rewriting history, but I think the, the best I can say is um, when I was 11 years old, my mother said to me, Paulie, we have two ears and one mouth. I think she said that to me because I wasn't listening. Um, and so the, it's so hard, when you're, particularly when you're on stage, say when you're on stage with Mike Tyson and it takes a minute for him to answer your question. And he answers it extraordinarily well. But you must not interrupt during that time. You must wait. Now, John, in some way, you, um, I nearly want to call you the sociologist, philosopher, historian um, of what it means for people to work together. Um, you say um, there isn't just one right, one right way for people to work together, but there do seem to be common threads that foster innovation and group group work. I know that when you were writing your magnificent book, you also listened to a lot of music while writing it. So I'd love you to tell us what works, what works, what doesn't work. Does a panel like this of two, four, six people work, or would we be better off if we were just two or three people? Um, would we be better off if we were in, 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 a, in a round configuration? You know, Georges Braque famously <laughs> said that um, everything takes a shape in which you put it. So. Uh, we'd probably Help me. be better in a bar, maybe. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it's probably, no, I think a round table is better than a long table, and probably, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of discussion on what the ideal group size is. I think some people, is there? Some people say 4.6, so that's, we're, that's right. We're right, is that, okay. Not counting the egos, 4.6. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, in, in both looking at innovation and groups that innovate historically, as well as going around the country and writing stories about technologists today and how they come up with, um, um, not only come up with new ideas, solve new problems, but actually transfer those new ideas to um, develop them and then deploy them. And I think, incidentally, we, we kind of overrate the uh, inspiration aspect because the uh, back end is far harder and more difficult, and that's when everybody falls apart and, and dies off and where that great idea never makes it. But um, I, unfortunately, I feel like for every rule, there's a, a kind of an exception. example. And, um, and I think 
Um, I think in, in a note I wrote to you, I mean, in the Bell Labs context, there was kind of, you know, these two great examples of, of historical precedents for these incredible technologies that occurred at Bell Labs. One was the transistor, and the other was the solar cell, which is the antecedent for every photovoltaic solar uh, panel in the world today. And uh, one was in 1948, one was in the early 1950s, and they were almost exact opposites. I mean, the transistor was a team that was directed, um, um, I, I like what Gordon said, where he said casting is 80% of, of it, where, where, where a team was literally cast into a role to sort of solve this very difficult problem. And I might say at Bell Labs, they thought of innovation in terms of problems, not in, not in terms of ideas. Um, I think is not a semantic difference. That's, that's how they conceived of it. But for the transistor group, it was a, a group of people with complementary talents, um, a bit of friction between the people, which I think was essential. We talk a lot about kinship and getting along, but I think tension is really essential as well. And tension is not necessarily a bad thing at all. Mm. Um, and, and that these were handpicked people who were given time and autonomy, a fair amount of money um, to pursue this kind of very clear goal. Uh, they were given permission to fail repeatedly over the course of several years. And eventually they came out with this uh, invention that was really one of the great, um, I think, uh, inventions of the 20th century, maybe of, 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 of the last 500 years. Um, the silicon solar cell was kind of the exact opposite, which I think goes to this point that um, oftentimes with, with group innovation, what I've noticed is that there's no formula, but there can be a structure that can facilitate this. And, um, and, and it's not fail, it, it's not foolproof, um, but that with these three guys kind of got together almost serendipitously in the right environment at the right time with the right problem. They were trying to solve some very abstruse problem within the Bell system of how to provide power for these kind of um, very isolated um, installations that, that were not on the grid and, and somebody had this kind of impure silicon um, uh, um, 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 uh, power uh, silicon uh, wafers that were generating this very large photovoltaic effect and they got together and they said why don't we use the power of the sun to solve this very modest problem for the bell system mm. and, um, and, 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 and there we have it and it was almost the exact opposite of the transistor and yet I think they were two of these breakthrough inventions so um, I'm very, I'm, 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 go ahead. That's right. These three people, thank you. Um, that's right. The three people who created the first silicon solar cell all, all worked in different buildings and they got together over lunch, which, which I might say is, is, is also a very crucial part maybe of that structure that um, as much as we talk about um, network science or network effects that um, there can probably be no, no substitution for face-to-face -face contact and that yeah. kind of serendipitous. Uh, you, this is the second that. time you use the word serendipity. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. No, I, I want you to use it. I, I want you to use it one one more time, if you can, to actually un unpack it a bit further. The importance. I mean, in some way, we're trying to create systems, right. and at the same time, we're leaving the world open to chance. Um, and serendipity is an extra. I mean, it's like digression in literature. You know, digression is the sunshine of narrative, and we need we need serendipity. But how do you? You can't create serendipity quite. No, no, you can't. You can put a lot of really smart people together or creative people or complementary talented people, people with different ways of looking at the world together and try and, and, try and look at it that way um, and hope that they will interact in a very kind of fertile way. Uh, I think, um, I mean, when, I, when I think of serendipity, I think of them literally bumping off each other um, casually, unpredictably, I think we've all had that experience where we a good idea comes to us not when we're thinking of it, but when we're casually bumping into somebody or we're walking to our car in the parking lot or to the subway station and that kind of casual exchange happens. You know, there's a wonderful line of Leonard Cohen that comes to my mind. He said, if I knew where inspiration came from, I would go there more often. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have a fantastic epigram in your, in your book, which I love. Um, from T.S. Eliot, the rock. What is the knowledge we have lost in information? Mm. Tell me why you put that in this particular book. I thought it was an interesting choice. I think that, I mean, there were a couple of different levels why I chose that. Um, one 
we, we live, I think, in an age of, of over-information, as I, I look at the Twitter feed <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> um, it's incredible. I'm, I'm very frightened to say anything. It appears immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but there, there is, there's so much um, noise out there. There is so much information. There's so much good information. There's so much bad information. But there's less and less, or not less knowledge, but knowledge gets more and more obscured, I think. And um, for me, there was that idea as well as the knowledge of understanding how technologies like this came about. And they certainly, you know, they didn't come about by being soaked in more and more data and information. They came about by people pursuing problems, um, pursuing ideas, um, pursuing um, things together as a group uh, that were very highly complex. And um, I don't, I don't want to go off too much, but I, I think um, when we talk about groups and innovation, I mean, the whole idea of innovation actually has a kind of group idea behind it. If you look at the origins of the word, um, it, it goes back to 16th century England. It was used to describe a new idea pertaining to religion or philosophy. But it really wasn't until the 1950s that it started being used in a kind of scientific and technological context. And I think um, that the word actually, um, and, and, and at Bell Labs and other places, they believed it filled a gap because the world had, was on its way to becoming so complex that um, the old words, invention, um, um, discovery, really didn't fit. And an innovation filled that kind of definition of a, uh, of a, a product. Of a leap, of a leap also. A leap, a leap, but also a kind of complex handoff between groups. I mean, at, at Bell Labs, for instance, it was between research and development, sometimes marketing and manufacturing and deployment. But that the world had grown complex, where at least in electronics, uh, no doubt in medicine as well, that um, there needed to be a group coordination that that idea of the lone brilliant inventor uh, could not suffice for an innovator, that that was a whole different idea and that innovation was a much more of a group endeavor. And when you, when I, I do want to ask you about this because it just interested me greatly. The book was written to music. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, why? Why? Uh, what did it afford you? What did, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure Matthew would be interested to know you listened to, sure. tell us what you listened to. Um, I, you know, I, I said there are different, well, for every innovation lesson, there's an opposite. So sometimes I listen to very hard music. Um, uh, Queens of the Stone Age, I, I like quite a bit right now. <laughs> but a lot of times I would listen to Bach. And, um, and Radiohead. And Radiohead, yes, very much. Uh, there's a band called The National. Uh, sometimes, too, if I was in a good place, I would play the same song over and over again and repeat it for wow. several hundred times. And being, be, being in a good example of the song. And, and, song. And why? Why would you listen to the same song over um, and over again? What? I don't know. Something about the rhythm would just kind of get in the right place. Everything in the and right And would place. give you momentum yeah, yeah, as a writer? Right. Um, yes. <laughs> Everything in the right place. Um, Everything in the right place. That's, yeah. Yeah. Jigsaw Falling Into Place by Radiohead off yeah. in Rainbows. Um, yeah. I'd probably listen to it sometimes yeah. 225 times yeah. in a row. <laughs> I, right. I understand yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> I think the Spotify... Uh, you know, residual is about three cents. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I bought I, the album. Um, you bought the, I, would, I love I, that. I bought the album. I just want to make sure that you know that I did. <laughs> I would like to, um, I think I'd like to open this up to a discussion between each one of you in some form or fashion. Questions you might have that might have emerged from what we've been talking about. John, you might have a question for someone. Gordon, you might have a question. As you know, I have too many questions. So let me turn this over to you a little bit. Even if there's a moment of silence, I'll ask you to respect it. See what I go through all the time? Um, I had a question for Gordon when he was talking about firing an actor. Or, oh. um, how, how does, I, I was actually, I, I mean, I'm curious about that actor's reaction, but how does it work in terms of the larger group when you get rid of that person? <laughs> Sorry to laugh. <laughs> um, well, um, most of the time when we're not doing well, we know it. Um, uh, when I've been fired from job, of, as, as, uh, who has not been fired from a job in this room, right? Not been well. You're, you're going to be. Yeah. <laughs> They're like 21, 22 years old. It's just, it's a first job. It, it just means, yeah, you're, you're still too, yeah. I mean, um, it's actually a great wake up call who, because. Who, who was it? There was somebody over like, there. Like, you know. Yeah, okay, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a painful quote. When you say it, I, I'm remembering this, 
difficult and painful situations when I've had to do it. Um, usually when we're not doing well, we know it. Sometimes we don't have the courage to quit, so we're begging somebody else to remove us from our misery. <laughs> um, that, I find that to be true. Um, uh, when you have to make the difficult decision, and it always takes, probably takes me, speaking personally, longer than it probably should, although I've gotten, this, does, this sounds crueler than I hope it, I hope it doesn't sound as cruel as I'm afraid it will. Really, that's what I want to say is, I've gotten better at it, um, because um, I've learned to trust my instincts. Um, uh, uh, you, um, the, the actor who is fired, it's extremely painful, but they, I cannot think of an example when someone didn't know that they were really messing up and in fact bringing down the show. I'm also a producer, I'm a director, but I run a theater company, I'm the artistic director, so occasionally I have to fire a director, and then usually it means I have to come in, which is an awful thing to do too sometimes. This doesn't happen that often, but, you asked it. Um, but then what happens, what effect does the that have the on the The rest of the company, yeah, well, the rest yeah. of the company, yeah. Well, um, the rest of the company um, uh, is some often relieved. I once fired an actor, a well-known actor, so it was doubly difficult, a famous actor. I had to fire him. Um, he was drunk and abusive, and I had to fire him. It wasn't fun. Somebody I'd admired since my childhood. And um, when I came, the, the rest of the actors were at a bar, uh, after rehearsal, and when I came to the bar to meet them all, I got a standing ovation from the actors. So they were relieved. Um, what often happens, more often than not, is everybody's scared for their job the next day. Mm -hmm. They're going, oh, am I next? Um, I don't find, because it's so clear when it happens, uh, I'm not trigger happy. So when it has happened, I find that it, um, um, it creates some terror in the group. Um, and a little bit where everybody's a little more serious the next couple of days, then because rehearsals should be fun. Um, but it doesn't, um, but everybody's very focused. And uh, I suppose they're afraid for their jobs a little bit. They realize that this perfect family that we thought we created actually has vulnerabilities. Um, um, but I, I don't find it, frankly, I, don't, I, I have never seen it destroy or injure a group in any significant way. I must say, I, I love reading this because I love the notion that I've become Holden Berg. But I mean, with a name like Holden Graber, it's very complicated. <laughs> My students used to say, hold and grab her. But um, so, uh, John, one, one thing you, you, you brought up in, in, in a commentary you sent to me is that you, you shy away from brainstorming sessions. And I am always kind of amused by the notion of people telling me to put on my thinking cap, as, as if I, you know, were to take it off and, anytime soon. But, but w w we nevertheless, you wrote this book, which was really a, a book about brainstorming in some way. And why do you shy away yourself? Um, yeah, I, I think... Um because you know, in, in some sense, excuse me for interrupting yeah. you, I'm doing exactly the contrary of what I was saying is listening, is that we, we find ourselves uh, in, in a tension here between solitude and solidarity, between being part of a group and being alone. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm sure everybody else on the panel has, has some thoughts on it too. I, I think, I mean, in, in organizations I've studied, Bell Labs or even you know, journalism, doing stories on IBM, for instance, or Tesla or Toyota, other companies, um, yeah, where does, where does a good idea come from? Does it come from a person or does it come from a group? Um, I, I mean, at Bell Labs, they believed it came from a person, a, a, an individual's mind, but that it needed a kind of group collaborative affiliation to actually uh, be developed, which I, I, I think makes sense to me. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's an ironclad rule. Um, for me, I think with brainstorming sessions, I, I do feel that... Um, they, they favor a certain kind of personality. I think I right. feel, uh, and Jocelyn um, would, I'm sure, have some interesting things to say about that, that, that I think that um, as, as somebody who's, who's probably more introverted, more geared towards listening, more geared towards synthesizing ideas after hearing them and then making sense of them, um, because, again, I think the world is noisy and it takes a lot of time sometimes. Yeah. 
Um, it's just, it's, it's a personal feeling. I, I don't, I, I'm sure brainstorming can work for some people. It has never worked for me. I know there's a, there's a book that is quite well known now. Um, I forget the name, I think the writer's name is Kane, about how to make introverts in some way shine in, in, play, shine in organizations or come out or speak or how, how to work with people who may not be the, the most charismatic and how not to privilege only those who are charismatic. Well, I mean, I think that that's probably the, one of those fundamental places where when we talk about inclusion, it becomes important. And in organizations like, like the one here, um, you know, I don't, I'm an extrovert and I, um, I don't like brainstorming because it, I don't think it does allow anyone time to distill. You know, it's sort of a, let's throw everything up there and and then we'll move on. And so I've, I find it to be a, a more difficult process. But I think that would you, what we as leaders always have to do is to figure out ways for people to get in. Now, I'm not someone who believes that you can change introverts because what that does is we're talking about, first of all, this whole huge group of people um, that we identify as introverts and then we go about changing them, sort of like changing someone's sexual orientation. Um, I mean, changing personalities like changing sexual orientation. It's probably not gonna happen really easily, nor inside most organizations. So I think what you do instead is you develop different systems to allow people to get in. That, that's the important thing, is to develop the kind of collaborative processes that allow people to come in in different ways, as different from, we only come in one way, which is we run our mouth. And if you can't come in that way, you can't get in. But, but that would be like not allowing you know, saying to people, listen, you're the flute. Now, if you all can get in, fine, but if not, we'll just go on without you. And it would just never happen. So, I mean, for me, yeah. that's really the, the notion about, the notion of inclusion. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's not only recognizing that people's voices are expressed in different ways and trying to figure out a way to draw that out, you know, sometimes actively, sometimes passively. I, the thing I struggle with more, because we have, we have more than one team at the Philharmonic, I mean, we have, 105 musicians, but we also have 90 professional staff who, you know, you know, run the organization. Um, it's helping people understand that, you know, it has to be a culture of ideas and a culture of exchange of information, and that's part of a process of getting to those great ideas. I mean, I would say absolutely at the Philharmonic, people come up with individual ideas, but a lot of times it just takes a gestation period for an idea to, or concept to come up and for it to become fully developed, you know, sometimes in months for us. Um, helping people understand that their idea, while maybe not leading to anything whatsoever, is important in that process, is, is part of, if you didn't have that, that culture of ideas and the sense of people being willing to put their ideas out, I don't know that you get to those really wonderful things. And I, that's for me, you know, as an executive director or CEO, really hard to help people understand because they feel as though if they put an idea out and it's not acted upon, somehow they've failed. And you want to say to them, no, quite the contrary. Um, your, your contribution is part of the process of getting to those great ideas, those great initiatives. It can't happen without them. Any, any other questions you might have for each other before we take questions from uh, those who tweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question for the group. Um, I find, um, uh, it, maybe this is just the, the tender world of the theater, but I suspect it's not true, which is that um, the, uh, um, I always have to remind myself never to underestimate another person's insecurity. Yeah, yeah. Another person's? Insecurity. That insecurity is one of the governing factors, not only, as well as being fired, <laughs> uh, uh, is, is the thing that governs, you know, um, everybody on this panel, not governs, but is a, is a, is, a, is, is a key factor in people's lives. Insecurity and Insecurity. fear. And fear. Insecurity and fear. And, um, and how well we manage that sometimes um, reflects how well we manage our lives. But um, that arrogance and um, all kinds of behavior that we would consider bad behavior usually comes out of insecurity. And it's something that I have to manage constantly. I'm wondering if that's something that you guys find in your fields as well. No, um, 
in 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 what what we do in our you know in in my work we were commissioned by a client to come up with an idea and then we work hard to come up with one or more ideas or something and then we'll um show them to the client and the client sometimes likes one of the ideas sometimes hates all the ideas and it sort of is it's it's it, one of the most interesting things to watch is if I'm presenting the work with one of my designers or with, with designers who've worked on it with me, and sometimes it's their ideas that are in front of the client and being rejected, in fact, right. your natural tendency is to jump in with your sword drawn valiantly and start to explain why you're wrong and why you know we're right, and they'll sort of fume in the elevator afterwards. They're saying, "But we're professionals. We're the guys that know. You know, who, how dare these people like presume to tell us that we don't? Uh, you know, why, you know." And it's and and you sort of, I mean, that's part of insecurity and it's part of hubris. But it goes back to um, um, something that um, uh, Paul said at the beginning. And and as I was listening to Matthew, I was thinking that my one instance of working with directly with a, um, a musician uh, was uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, who's the, we, we designed an identity for uh, New World Symphony, which he runs down in Miami. He's a musician, he's an educator, he's a conductor. And when I, th it was really difficult. We came out with a good result and I failed over and over again. I have the most botched bunch of things that I had done for him that he was remarkably patient with. And I remember they came all to a climax going into a, a weekend where his assistant said, you know, um, Michael did a couple of sketches and he's sending them to you and maybe you could just look at them. And this was his ideas for what their logo could be. And this is after we've been working on it for six months. I was so pissed off when I got this. I'm like, how, you know, this, how, you know, do I try to, conducting doesn't look that hard to me. Do I try to like go tell him? No. You know, so um, I was like so peeved. And then I sort of like took a deep breath and I thought, now wait a second, he's taking time, he's a really busy guy, he's completely peripatetic. And if he can sort of take that time to give me a little hint, I owe it to him to honor that time that he spent on it just by shutting up and listening and paying attention. And that was the breakthrough, actually. It sort of reset us and put us on a new course. And it was partly, my reaction wasn't arrogance, it wasn't hubris, it was actually insecurity. I knew that I was kind of like, you know, on the cliff's edge and I just was thinking I could just holler my way to safety. And instead, if you just shut up, and just let the just be in the moment and learn what you can from the moment. It's amazing what can happen. Well, so, what was the eure eureka moment for you? When did you actually find how to do it right for him? Oh, um, <laughs> you can look this logo up online. But basically, he wanted to make an N, a W, and an S for New World Symphony, and have them all connect up with each other. And they're very hard letters to kind of like interweave, as it turns out. Um, and then I realized. You know, I, I was literally saying to my wife, you know, is, is, conducting doesn't look that hard at me. Then I realized that's what conductors do. They just kind of have this repeated motion that always goes back to the first point and kind of j traces a line in space. And he never, so he didn't put it to me that way. Then I thought, you know, and I actually got a book on conducting. I looked at the diagrams for it. And sort of that metaphor, which resonated obviously really well with not just him, but people in the musical community, uh actually was the thing that was there. Up till then, I just was doing all this graphic it's, design bullshit like I learned in school. Like my, <laughs> like my, I, I was bringing I mean, all my expertise it, to and ignoring theirs. Fantastic, yeah. no, I mean, it, yeah. the story brings to my mind, I once interviewed the, the, the great artist from uh, California, Ed Ruscha, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Ed Ruscha said that he loved uh, drawing the letter S, he loved the feeling yeah. of it. Yeah. And I told him at that point uh, that my boy loved drawing the letter S, but even loved more the drawing the number eight. <laughs> and he said, without hesitation, I hope your boy is doing a lot of ice skating. <laughs> and it was just so, <laughs> so visually pungent. Yeah, anyway, yeah. you were going to say something, Matthew. No, no, no. I think it's a terrific. I think it's a terrific story. I mean, it's yeah. it, he he needed to find a way to express to you yeah. what he the the idea, the vision that he had, and what this logo would embody. Not just for the organization, but for him, I think, yeah, yeah. and what he is trying to accomplish. And, and I admired, and, you, and I came to see firsthand the skill of someone in that position that you guys share. That um, that of how you're able to give people the right cues, frustrate them momentarily, but kind of manage to kind of lead them to the, you know, to the better place somehow. That is the same as Joe Torre, you know. Yeah. I'm going to take some. Uh, how should I call these? Tweeted, tweeted questions. 
um, some, so how do I do this? Um, so I read them. I, I choose one. Is that right? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so much power. So I, much I know. Power. You know, I kind of enjoy it. Um, I'll take the first one. I think it's for you, Michael. Does sharing in the profit include sharing in the risk? In what way does this encourage people to try new things? Um, well, it's interesting. Is it actually, we find it works both ways. Obviously, um, feeling financially secure in your own business, regardless of the ups and downs you're having, helps people be a little bit more um, relaxed and perhaps a bit more daring in the risks that they take. But we've actually had um, uh, partners have proposed, you know, um, that they do something um, risky and that they fund it themselves. There's, people become sort of, sort of cautious of kind of squandering your partner's generosity and your partner's trust in you. They think, no, I just want to go out and do this myself. And actually, that sort of is really frowned upon, you know? Um, people say, that's almost a sure way to kind of people say, no, no, don't worry, we're gonna be, we'll be behind you on this one, right? Um, so I think that's within, you know, the, the, the 19 partners we have, uh, of which I'm one, there's no hierarchy and we reach all our decisions by consensus and that's been going on for 40 plus years too. Within my team though, it's pretty simple. I let, um, uh, the designers that work for me, I absorb all the risks that they take. So you, tr I, you trust yeah, them? I never let them uh, take the blame for something that goes wrong. Like if, if, a, if something's disastrous in front of, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like, I mean, sometimes I lie. Let's say we're unicorn, but we have a disastrous meeting and some idea just went right into the toilet. I'll come out and say that was my fault. I could, you know, I should, I, there, there was something I missed along the way. Your thing was great. It was my fault. And I find that's just a way of kind of giving them the, you know, believe me, they learn what they need to learn by the audience reaction. They don't need me emphasizing it, you know? I, I think we, one of the things that, for, for this audience is, you are always sharing in the profits and sharing in the risk, whether we articulate it or not. Um, quick example, I was doing some work recently with a hospital in another state, so it wasn't you, no, no, not another state, and um, the cleaning staff felt like they were being treated like fourth class citizens. They were being demeaned by the nursing staff. Well, the way it shows up is a patient was is told friends and family, I will never go back to that hospital. But it wasn't because of the care of the physicians. It was not because of the care of the, the technology folks. It was because of the tension that was going on between the cleaning staff and the nurses. So my notion is we are always sharing yeah, in the yeah. profit and the risk, whether we, whether we think about it or not. There's, there's a question there that um I'll pose to all of you. I mean, I could speak a little bit about a library, but I, I'm, I'm going to talk less now. What kind of a library learning environment creates spaces for diversity, inclusion, innovation, progress? John, talk, talk for just one second. If I could provoke yeah, an yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, please provoke. Go I'm in him. the midst of reading his book. You talk a, a few times about the, the physical buildings that Bell Labs worked in and how their design was considered, in fact, one of the innovations that they were the most proud of because of the way they sort of accomplished that. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, if we, if we go back in time of uh, 60 years, um, World War II actually had a, a tremendous effect on the technology outlook for people in this country. They, they witnessed um, certain advances, uh, especially in radar and nuclear weaponry, um, during a very compressed time frame. And for, for technology managers, this small group of, of, of mandarins who watched and managed these kinds of projects, what they saw was that interdisciplinary teams uh, could actually make breakthroughs and developments in um, kind of time frames they never before thought possible. Now, this fellow um, at, at Bell Labs, who's kind of a centerpiece of the book, uh, a very, very great technology manager named Mervyn Kelly, um, really took this lesson to heart. And when they kind of designed this laboratory for their post-war work, they were down here in Manhattan, Bell Labs was, um, until the early, mid-1940s. And then they moved to a, a campus in New Jersey. Um, he came to the belief um, that really new ideas, the last thing, it sounds obvious now, the last thing you want are like-minded people sitting together, um, exchanging ideas. 
what you want. Uh, actually, new ideas uh, arise from the interface of different disciplines, different domains, different talents, and different people. So therefore, you create an architecture that um, um, provokes that, I guess, is, is one way to put it. Um, so you do not have um, the physics people all together. You separate offices from laboratories. You intersperse research and development. You basically make sure that everybody is going to have to bump into everybody else, mm -hmm. and that your next door neighbor might not necessarily be working on anything at all related to what you're working on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking also in, in closing as we speak about teamwork, that we, we must in a way be a team for ourselves mm -hmm. and in some way inspire, I mean, I think that the overriding uh, in, uh, importance here is uh, the notion of curiosity at, at the deepest level. I, I remember uh, Napoleon once said of one of his generals, he knew everything but nothing else. And, and, and uh, you know, that's so, that's so dangerous. It's a dangerous way of being and it's certainly a way we have of being in the world. I also remember uh, to quote somebody else, my father when I was 17 years old told me, don't forget that the word university comes from the word universe. And indeed that way of thinking came from his own own experience. He was a medical student in 1936 in the best medical school in the world, he says. I love saying this to doctors here. In Vienna, the only other medical school as good as that one was for some reason, he says still today, at the age of 95, in Montpellier in France. So there was Vienna and Montpellier. And he said, OK, so you're going to study law and philosophy. I studied law and philosophy in Europe. Go cross the street and go to the medical school. And he said that because he was remembering the Vienna of his, of his childhood, where across the street from the law school was a medical school. And he said, you know, you're going to study Plato and Aristotle and Descartes and all of these various philosophers, but be sure to go to an anatomy class and to see how they cut open a body. And of course, he knew who he was saying this. I mean, I turn green if I see a little bit of blood. So it, but. I think there was a certain way of thinking that what we need to do, and we need to do it when, we, uh, when we're in a situation of a team, we need quite metaphorically and perhaps literally cross the street. Yeah. I, I was, you know, from before we came down to speak to you today, I mean, Rosalind really said the most important thing to me today, which was what, what has gotten us to this place so far won't get us to the next place. Yeah. And so this balancing of creating this sort of innovative environment, this create, creative environment, but also understanding that there's, there's a necessity. There's a necessity in, in our situation, which is to say that um, certainly for us as cultural institutions, that we can't necessarily have the luxury of doing what we've always done and think that the exact same way that we've always thought about what we do. So. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to know about, you know, again, going back to Bell Labs, is there something that we can take from, they were looking to solve problems. So how did they balance the sense of problem solving with just pure creativity, pure innovation? Yeah, um, yeah uh, fascinating question. I, I think um, I'm kind of going back to what Paul was saying where he mentioned the word curiosity. Um, I think I think that's that's one one way to look at it. As I said, was to think in terms as they did of good problems. I mean, I, I interviewed a lot of people who 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 had worked there during its heyday, and um, there was a kind of delight when they would find a good problem because there are so many ideas out there, but there aren't that many really great problems. And when they alighted on one that was really really good, that was a, a moment of, of of a kind of celebration because then you could actually direct your energies toward it. Um, but I think curiosities really important. Um, I think we, we live in a moment where we're talking about um, market-driven competition as a spur to innovation, but if you look at history, it tells us that most of the great breakthroughs in at least the history of the 20th century and 19th mm -hmm. come from very curious people who are self-driven. 
and that as much of a goad as competition can be to bring, bring out, say, great consumer products or, or the like, um, and it, it's not incidental, it, it is significant that um, curiosity, I think, obliterates everything else. I'm, I'm curious, though, if in, in closing now, we, we can't somehow come to a formal agreement um, between this hospital and the Philharmonic for these exchanges between musicians and, I mean, I, I'm speaking here to the CEO, so I, I'd like to actually get you to say this to, to our audience and to the doctors here, that there should be some kind of, you should cross the street. I mean, I, I would love to Absolutely. be able to tell my father that I've implemented this. Yeah, we're, 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 already, we're already in discussions about this, knowing that there can be potentially huge benefit from bringing physicians into a concert environment, into a rehearsal environment, uh, and conversely, bringing musicians into a medical environment. Um, I think there can be huge, huge learning on both sides. So it's in the works. OK. That's not good enough, is it? No, not quite. <laughs> I, I don't I want, have any tickets to with me today. <laughs> no, but, but I, I think it, it's so interesting to, to think that this is necessary, as, as I do think it's important. I think Colombia now has a, a, a medicine and narrative history. I, Oliver Sachs and others are, are working in that, where I think it's so important for doctors to begin to understand literature because they begin to understand narrative. They begin to have a better understanding of the stories that patients tell them. And I think for for, for a, an orchestra to be able to come into a hospital and vice versa, that exchange, that form of you know, pontificating in the true Latin sense of the word, pontifex, building a bridge between disciplines would be so interesting if it were to happen, rather than just paying lip service to it, really making it happen, implementing it. Standing behind. I think I'll, I'll interject here that uh, I think you'll all agree this was an exceptionally rich conversation. We're indebted to Paul and to all the panel members for an incredibly stimulating discussion. Thank you. We'll meet in a half an hour.